Find the theory of categories that inside theory of sets. And so, and it's the title of the book, I think that theory of categories is really the formal theory, not of being as such, but of words. That is, of all forms of configuration of being. And also, that go to my world, last world, really. Across all of these experiences, I propose to say that there exists three ontological possibilities, in fact. Three, uh, and probably we can classify at the end philosophy along uh, these three lines. Ontology can be theory of the one. It has been largely the case during, in fact, uh, classical metaphysics. What I what I never name onto theology. There is always some proximity to religious conception in uh, metaphysics. But not exclusively. So, for example, uh, the, ontology, the ontology of Deleuze is uh, explicitly. And it is not a religious ontology. <laughs> Maybe it is a theology of, a theology of life. Second possibility, ontology as a theory of the multiple. It's mine, but don't name mine. It's also the ontology of Democritus, atomistic ontology. It's not theory of that, but it's theory of the multiple. And I think that the third form of ontology is a theory of relations. Not one, not multiple, but relations. There is something like that in Kant. And it's uh, explicitly uh, 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 the second form of uh, the ontology of Deleuze, because Deleuze affirmed that being is relation. So the one is relation. So what it said is relation. And so it's a possibility of classification of philosophy along the line of the It's finished. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Amadou, for this exciting presentation. So maybe now we could open it to, the, to your questions. Would like to start? Yeah? I have a question about the, the arguments and the structure of the universe. So, if you can speak slowly, because I'm going to know. I don't okay. <laughs> so, the basis of this question, I guess, is how um, different elements are excluded from different disciplines. So, on the one hand, in math itself, the subject and the event are at a certain level excluded. And then, on the other hand, uh, in philosophy, the real science of being is, in some sense, excluded. So the way um, I read being an event is that the way that we can capture the subject in math uh, is through a kind of trace or a symptomatic reading, where um, insofar as math 
has repressed as unconscious its uh, truth status. It at the same time needs to consistently develop uh, its results within the within compatibility with being. And so we see enforcing uh, the subject at play without math actually knowing that. And then so my question is if can you see uh, something parallel in how philosophy is able to talk about ontology. So, so since um, the, the actual sayability of being is only in the, the letters, the writing of math, and then being, the word being is not a concept of math, is it that in order to find, um, in order to say math is ontology, we have to perform the same kind of symptomatic reading on the history of philosophy and, and find the point in which the history of philosophy has suppressed its mathematical condition. So, so we have a kind of interweaving of, of repressions and symptomatic readings that we need to cut across one another. Yeah, I, I think you, you, you are perfectly clear I largely uh, agree with you. You know, the point concerning mathematics, there is a, a complexity. Because mathematics is ontology. But uh, mathematics is a science. So uh, a part of mathematics is itself a truth procedure. As a, uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, philosophy explained what is a truth procedure inside uh, mathematical formalization. But mathematical formalization is itself a truth procedure. And so, philosophy is near something like uh, philosophical meta mathematics. And I have said meta mathematics and not metaphysics. And so it's a uh, your uh, everything. Uh, it, it, it's cool. If, if, if you observe the fact themselves, even uh, when uh, when I read some pages of being an event, <coughs> I see something like that. That is uh, what is inside philosophy and not inside mathematics, and what is inside mathematics but not inside philosophy is the uh, uh, first classification. But after that, we must return to the, the process itself. Or oh, we have, in the becoming of mathematics, we have, naturally, events, transformation, procedure of truth, and so on. So we can also write about mathematics in a complete philosophical disposition, that is, with also uh, uh, event, consequences of an event, and so on. But this way of thinking mathematics from the point of view of uh, complete philosophy is also a way uh, where you use the object of thinking inside the construction of the thinking itself. And so, there is something like a feedback, a, a metaphoric feedback. <coughs> and, the, and, it is, and it is generally also the origin of a, a form of difficulty to speak of all that with mathematicians. And, it's not, and, and I understand the difficulty, it's not, uh, it's not a critique. Because of the... Sometimes they think, one hypothesis that I say that what they think is essential, but in some sense it's not essential because when I want the truth, I am outside mathematics. <laughs> or on the other hand, he, 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 he can say, okay, we have also a procedure of a truth, but uh, they use something of mathematics in a sense which is not the mathematical significance. And so we are. And so, uh, 
Il propose, once more, a paradoxical relation fit between philosophy and mathematics, but I have a general theory of that sort of thing, because in my general conception, philosophy is uh, under four types of conditions, uh, mathematics, of science more generally, uh, politics, uh, law, and arts, and uh, the paradoxical relationship we can find in the four cases. It's clear, for example, that if you study the relationship between politics and philosophy, it's a, a very complex situation. Sometimes uh, we cannot exactly define the, the difference. And it is why it exists something like uh, uh, political philosophy, which is a monster. <coughs> Exactly, if you say mathematical philosophy, it's a monster. My philosophy is not a mathematical philosophy. It's a philosophy who uses mathematics in some sense. But mathematical philosophy cannot exist. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, political, uh, philosoph political philosophy, it's uh, in some sense. Uh, in some sense, epistemology too. Philosophy of science, philosophy like that. And it is because it's a moment of you are under a condition and uh, uh, you adopt the position to be before the condition. That to speak philosophically uh, concerning the condition, where in fact you are under the condition. Because at the end, truths come before philosophy. And philosophy is a theory of truths under the condition of real truths. And it is why we have, uh, in fact, the, the difficult uh, and uh, <laughs> complex relationship you speak of.
re retrospectively, if we could say, given that there is politics, there is husband, there is enough conviction, if today the event would have had such a central role in the ontological construction. Mm -hmm. uh, I have other questions for the <laughs> Yes, first uh, I agree with you that uh, the beginning, uh, the, my decision to suppress politics <coughs> in big and even, in the consecutive melancholy, is also a weakness for the book itself. Because it's evident that precisely after all the sequence of Mesitain and so on, the most, uh, uh, most clear example inside the condition of philosophy of what is an event would be of political nature. But I insist on the point that it's not true that the uh, event exists only in political field. It's very important. And I have written in fact, for example, uh, 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 about uh, uh, a really clear example of what is an event in the field of law. <coughs> when you are melancholic, you have always love and you rise on <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> the new form of newness. And uh, the encounter, what is named the encounter, in the, in the process of law, is clearly the opening of the possibility which is uh, 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 not the possibility itself, but in some sense the possibility of the possibility. And so we can describe, after all, some forms of events outside uh, uh, politics. And uh, uh, in fact, in being an event, I propose to only uh, what we can name the ontological part of the analysis of events. Paradoxically, what is the being of event? We can say that being an event is something as a, a, a set which, uh, in some sense, uh, has a paradoxical situation to uh, eliminate the axiom of foundation. So, an event is a multiplicity which is an element of itself. But it's very important because it, uh, uh, the event is a uh, uh, an exception to the systemic organization of uh, the theory of sets around the axiom of foundation, and the event is something like a non-founded set. And it's an image, but it's a, it's a, it's a positive image that something which happens is not founded in the situation at all. But uh, I accept your, uh, your remark, I accept your critique, at the level of being an event, uh, uh, event is crucial, but uh, in some sense uh, inexplicit. Yeah. And so, uh, immediately, you have had many suspicious considerations concerning the event. Okay, finally, it's the old theory of a miracle. <coughs> it's a general case of a miracle. But it's not a miracle, I can, I can, I can give an example of what is precisely a non-founded multiplicity, which is uh, supplementary to the situation. But it's true that being an event is not uh, complicated, yeah? because of the sacrifice of politics. <coughs> and it's true that I cannot return to the Category of the event clearly uh, uh, after that. So it's uh, and I, I, have, I have been also disappointed by the fact that uh, very often my theory has been reduced to a theory of an event. <coughs> so it was too much for me. Oh, event. <laughs> after all, event is for me. Some, something very near nothingness, but which has the power to create the possibility. And I am not really interested concerning the event in some sense. <laughs> it's not at all a miracle for me. It's uh, what something which happens uh, in, uh, as a 
uh, revelation in some sense of the void of the situation, of the emptiness of the situation. It is part of the situation with the, uh, which is exposed to the proper internal uh, negativity. And uh, uh, when you have said all that uh, and found the uh, uh, revelation of the, uh, the, the, the world, the antecedent, uh, something which is uh, near nothing, <coughs> but really fundamental, and uh, which is not the creation of the truth, but only the opening of the possibility of the process of truth, it, 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 it's, a, it's true that I cannot say much more, except descriptions, except phenomenological descriptions. And, and the best interesting field in this case is uh, probably uh, political, but, but not, not, not exclusive. Continuing uh, on uh, Gabriel's question, uh, I think uh, I, I agree with you that uh, probably um, the concept of event has been upplayed a little bit uh, in overall understanding of, of the project. Maybe if the book was not called Being an Event, um, being something else, that would have helped. Uh, being in the school, yeah. Being Sorry. a school. But I think. Uh, and along with your earlier comment, which is uh, goes to, to the project that I'm working, some aspects, some other aspects of the main proposal is downplayed in the in the book as well. Um, reading your being an event or your mature work, uh, including being an event, from the perspective of uh, or uh, retrospectively from the works that you had from 1960s, Mark Mark and Lag, uh, and uh, uh, earlier works. Um, my reading is that there have been three questions that is at the heart of the entire project. And these three questions you are not very explicitly said anywhere, but this is this is how I read it. It's a question of beginning, the question of interiority, and the question of um, novelty. So my reading of your work is that these three questions from the get-go were implicitly embedded in all the work that you have done. And I think in various different stages, you have different proposals in debate or in confrontation with different philosophers. What is the best way to create a framework that we can think beginning, we can think interiority, and we can think uh, novelty? And I think the mature formulation has uh, two proposals. That being is infinite, and the form of thinking adequate uh, to the infinity of being is axiomatic. And in that sense, I think the equality of ontology to mathematics is really equality of um, that form of thinking that is ad adequate to the infinity of being, which is a sort of thinking that does not have objects, is a sort of being that uh, is owes its consistency to itself. And that is exactly the definition of, and the only science that we have today, or ever had, that meets this non-objective uh, mode or modality of thinking is mathematics. So, as a matter of fact, it is not a contingent or uh, contingent proposal. It's not something that just we can construct a form of form of argument that derives mathematics equal to uh, ontology is a form of thinking that comes from a more preliminary or primordial uh, thesis that being is infinite and thinking is axiomatic. Which, the combination of this, and this gets to the earlier point that I had, the best combination of this is axiom of infinity. 
Axiom of infinity is, to me, uh, the most important, or, or what is sayable of, of me. Uh, axiom of infinity is uh, the only other existential axiom in uh, Zermelo Franklin, but that is the axiom that actually uh, challenges the linguistic term. And every interesting, um, including Cohen's proof, including all the inconsistency proofs, is deriving the consequences of how serious we think about the axiom of infinity. So the relationship of these three questions, beginning, interiority, and novelty, I think finds its final framework uh, in being an event on the the investment that we have on the axiom of infinity. That's uh, that's what, what was the comment that was made. It's perfectly true. Perfectly true. And uh, uh, because uh, uh, the question of uh, axiom of infinity is simultaneously uh, the idea that the uh, in fact, as you say, that the true thinking is uh, always at the end in axiomatic form. Uh, and uh, second, uh, also, uh, that uh, the question to begin, beginning, must be posed inside uh, uh, the realm of the infinite. Because, in some sense, only infinite begins. <clears throat> the finite uh, is a false beginning, by the way, because the end is inside the beginning of the finite. The end is the same thing as the beginning. So all effective creation is of uh, infinite nature. And I say that concerning truth procedure. The truth procedure itself is uh, infinite, uh, must be infinite. And so, uh, if thinking is axiomatic and uh, all what is creation is uh, infinite, axiom of infinity is uh, uh, at the center of uh, the mathematical world. But, but, but it's precisely uh, the goal of my present book. <laughs> Uh, a big part of the book is concerned, concerned precisely not the axiom of infinity, but uh, the multiplicity of axiom of infinity. That is a mathematical problem. Is that we have one formal axiom of infinity, but after that we have many possible decisions concerning the level of, uh, and the type of, uh, of infinity, and we have very complex realm of uh, the infinite. And so the problematic of the axiom of infinity finally open uh, the question of uh, the hierarchy of types of, of uh, infinite and the signification of that sort of hierarchy. And it's, a, uh, it's the center of my, of my new book. And uh, I can say uh, it's a uh, Supplementary remark in your direction uh, concerning being an event. In being an event, uh, the question of the infinity is not uh, really uh, explored. Naturally, uh, it's affirmed that the uh, truth procedure is infinite and so on. But what is exactly the development of the uh, axiomatic theory of the infinite is, uh, in some sense, to be. So I agree uh, with you here, but uh, I exclude myself because I am writing <laughs> today <laughs> largely, largely <laughs> concerning precisely the extraordinary contemporary theory of the infinite, which is, uh, which is uh, absolutely active now, not uh, in the time of Cantor and so on. We have, uh, we have with uh, Jensen, with Woody, uh, and so on, we have uh, present moment, uh, new, new spectacular, uh, new theorems and uh, exposition of the question of the infinite. And uh, 
I think, I think you know, for a very long time I think that something in our representation of the concrete universe is uh, unclear because uh, it does not use the concept of infinite properly. And you know, very often you have something in mathematics and uh, the, uh, the use of the concept, mathematical concept in physics, a big time after. The, the most uh, striking example in the, the theory of the codics, uh, which is uh, uh, in ancient Greece, and the use for theory of uh, planets and so on, which are in the uh, restricted uh, theory, so, uh, thousand uh, <coughs> years after. I am, I am sure that uh, we must one day use the modern theory of the infinite, so the axiomatic of the infinite, the contemporary axiomatic of the infinite, and also uh, our vision of uh, the concrete world of the universe. And uh, it's my hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, it's also in your question, in your question. For example, what is the beginning? Today the theory has Big Bang. So it's the theory of the one. You have one point. And it's not, I think it, 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 it cannot be the truth. It can be the truth. It's a simplification. And we must return to much more the idea that at the beginning we have explosions of infinite multiplicity. I think it's a vision probably more interesting. <laughs> I think maybe we, it's, we can take a break for a few minutes now in our intensity of thought here. Uh, shall we say 10 minutes? Yeah, okay, 5 to 10. 5 to 10 minutes, <laughs> and then we'll regroup and maybe begin to look at a couple of passages uh, as much as we have time for from the book and in my experience it's never a fault. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's not a, it's, uh, we're in some sense beyond the question of a philosophy of experience versus a philosophy of the concept, but it's rather maybe a, a, a decision interior to the, to the latter, interior to our understanding of a philosophy of the concept, that is between the concept and the axiomatic. Uh, and so I'm, you, in the third meditation, you build a distinction between a certain philosophy of the concept that I think you link to Frege versus an axiomatic orientation of thought. Uh, and I'm, it seems to me that, that that decision as well opens a whole series of um, developments in the book, as you say, even pointing toward a certain understanding of the event as, what did you say, the event 
as a non-founded, a non-grounded sect, as I think a certain relation to the ax an axiomatic orientation. So my question is this. How, what concept, what, what understanding of the concept allows a distinction between a certain philosophy of the concept, say, Vega, and an axiomatic orientation. Let me just read one sentence and invite your, your, your commentary. No? I have the sentence in French. Uh, L'axiomatisation est requise pour que laisser à l'implicite de sa règle de compte, le multiple soit délivré sans concept, c'est-à-dire sans impliquer l'être de l'un. Le multiple, pour que le multiple soit délivré sans concept. So, how are we to understand the distinction, the break, the intervention, that you're making here between a certain philosophy of the concept and an axiomatic orientation. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very fundamental question concerning not only my position, but all the history of philosophy. Maybe the history of philosophy can be uh, read as the conflict between conceptual, which is also definitional, uh, uh, definition of philosophy, and uh, something like uh, the necessity of some axiomatic decision to open a new sequence of thinking. I think it's a uh, it's presented the opposition between Aristotle and Plato, in fact. Because uh, uh, the philosophy of Aristotle is made of definitions. It's made of definitions. And so it's a conceptual way in its uh, uh, best sense, in some sense. That is, we, we must be satisfied when we have uh, explain and find the good definition of a concept and uh, to have the good definition of a concept we must examine all definitions of the, the same concept mm -hmm. and, and, and we know uh, practically always Aristotle begin the text by the examination of all historical positions concerning the concept the infinite uh, in uh, Parmenides, Democrates, and so on. And at the end, Aristotle say, they have all seen an aspect of the question, but uh, I am the first to uh, discern the totality of the determination, and I have the good definition. And uh, in, in Plato, uh, it's completely different. Apparently, Plato also is in the search of good definitions, because uh, it's, a, it's a, the process of, uh, of uh, the dialogue of Plato uh, can be resumed as the search of a definition. But we must immediately do two remarks. First, generally, uh, the good definition is no good. That is the end of the dialogue. Finally, ah, it's uh, apoetic uh, construction. But finally, we don't uh, find the good definition. And second, in the more dogmatic <laughs> writing of Plato, it's not really a question of definition. It's a really very often question of something we cannot be defined, <coughs> which is different. And so the opening of something else, concerning, for example, the idea of good, so on, the fundamental concept of Plato. And so, uh, I think that 
in the definition of conceptual vision, we have finally the conviction that the, that the truth is in the form of the correct language. That is the language which uh, is in the field of the correct definitions of all concepts. And so it's uh, it's a Wittgensteinian vision, something like that, in the modern field. That is a philosophy of language, which is not a language uh, without sense. And you know Wittgenstein in Tractatus says that uh, all philosophical propositions are nonsense. <coughs> and I propose to to accept that in some sense it's true that philosophical proposition must be nonsense because the sense is always something which is prepared or present in the common opinions. And we come to the real problem which is the opposition between truth and opinion. And I think that in the in the conception of Aristotle, the goal Modification of the, the state of affairs and something like that. 
And uh, uh, the political vision in the terms of rupture and so on, it is axiomatic. We must have fear something first. And after that, uh, maybe you find the means and so on. But what, what comes first is the affirmation of the principle. And so uh, I am on the second side. Certainly. Um, I was thinking maybe to develop this distinction that Nick was uh, reminding us between the concept and axiom. I would say also that um, if you think of those two terms, I see a parallel between uh, the concept as being related uh, to the existence of the one. Because after all, after all, you can make concepts and definitions of more or less everything, right? The concept is somehow on the side of the, the totality as such. Whereas, in a sense, uh, if philosophy works rather with axioms, then we could say uh, that philosophy also assumes the kind of not all the, of the, those inconsistent multiplicities and in a sense only uh, separates a part of those inconsistent multiplicities to kind of uh, take it into her field and, and count it as one. So in a sense axiom as such is also the operation, the count as one, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the, 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 for, uh, for me, uh, the, the thesis of, uh, of uh, being an event, for me, uh, the one is always the result and not a uh, primitive uh, donné. What is the uh, one is uh, the result of, uh, of a con, the uh, result of uh, an operation. Not uh, what is at the general beginning is only uh, multiplicity. And multiplicity as such, uh, multiplicity without one. So infinite multiplicity in the form uh, of uh, something which cannot be reduced to any form of the one. And uh, if you uh, want to, uh, to create uh, the knowledge of a part of uh, the multiplicity, we will decide uh, concerning uh, the, the part itself. So we must Count for one the part you observe or think and so on. And uh, it's, it's, it's clear in science that uh, you, you construct the field of knowledge in science by automatization, but also, uh, also in some sense by experimentation, because experimentation is always first a sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, fragmentation of the real which is observed. You eliminate many parameters to have a good observation. <clears throat> and so it, uh, it has been uh, developed clearly by Bachelard, for example, that uh, experimentation is a part of theory. <clears throat> it's a part of theory because uh, the experimentation itself uh, uh, is axiomatic. In some sense. Because we, we we observe uh, with the idea of the result. <coughs> and so we, we cut in the real the adequate part of your thinking. And so uh, I, 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 it, it, it's true that, the, it's true that the, the, the question of uh, separation, of uh, bias to motivation, okay, is a fundamental part of all true thinking. And it is why there is uh, no contradiction between uh, knowledge and decision. It's a very classical opposition in the field of knowledge. We have a, a, a common way to find a good definition, and we have something consensual in some sense. And in decision, we have rupture. But in fact, it's not the case. All forms of uh, all forms of uh, construction of a part of the region is uh, always in some sense a decision. Uh, 
Um, so this question sort of deals with three sort of points of language in the eighth meditation um, that I feel are linked and I'm having trouble sort of unpacking what they could be. Which is you, you speak of the danger of the void um, and subsequently the anxiety of the void, which is linked with Heideggerian mm-hmm. care. Um, but you also speak from this of, of chaos, and you mention it twice, and you say, to some effect, these, the, the double structuration is predicated on chaos and not being, which implies that chaos is somehow as fundamental or related fundamentally to void and being, but is not either. And what chaos means is, is, is an interesting sort of thing to me because maybe it's because it's October of 2017 and we're coming up on the centenary of an event. It's important to call it. Uh, you, you speak of haunting, something haunting presentation. Um, and, and this connection is sort of obvious for psychoanalysis and it's obvious for Marxism. Um, and it's only through sort of Hamlet and Derrida that it's obvious to ontology why haunting is important. And I'm wondering in what way, in this like one page, if any, chaos and anxiety and haunting are connected, and what that could mean for structure. Could you point out the page? Right? Yeah, it's 110 in the French, and it's 98 in the English. Do you have a sentence? Here? Yeah, well, it's, it's sort of the no, first really? five paragraphs. Yeah. Um, oh, the first five paragraphs. I don't know what it is. Oh, yes, 109 to the bottom of that 110 in the front. Uh, so the haunting, the haunting one, it begins, Je uh, que l'investigation de tout, that's in the middle of 110, and it's the last sentence of that paragraph. Um, and then chaos is mentioned at the top paragraph of 110, and the second paragraph in 109. Chaos, le vide, l'angoisse du vide. Okay. Yeah. The word. Yeah, it's, it's haunting. Okay. Okay. So okay. So I think it's just the right. So it's like the beginning of meditation aid. Like just the first five, six paragraphs of meditation aid. Do you want the French? Yeah, the French. Page 93. 93 in the other one. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, chaos, and then it goes to sort of um, haunting. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the <laughs> question? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> no, well, uh, final, uh, uh, final question. Because what is the connection between the, the use of the term haunting um, and, and the chaos that you speak of? And I, I link that sort of because. Chaos is anxiety making, at least in psychoanalysis. It's 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 chaos, it's 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 chaos, anxiety, and structure. And and yeah. yeah. And haunting. The V. If you have this version of being on the bed or the PDF, it's on page 93. Mm. I'm it's sorry, not, yeah. It's it's not, not, by the is it you saying anxiety? What is you saying for haunting? I don't find the word. My translation literally says haunting. The French says en Yeah, It's haunting. But yeah. uh, where is it? It's on you know, your yeah. I, I interpret your question in uh, the light of, in fact, a uh, point of uh, weakness in the book, really. Why? Because what is Kao? What is Kao? Kao is, in some sense, uh, being as such, nothing else. Because uh, uh, being as such is inconsistent with duplicity. 
That is what I know that uh, multiplicity, infinite, uh, without any structure, which is the pure multiplicity as such. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, what I name a situation, but it's, it's not sufficient, in fact, it is uh, your weakness. And we can clarify all that at the level of the logic of the world. What is saying here is that if you have no double structuration of all that, uh, you have, you return to the classical anxiety in regard of something without any structure, precisely. And uh, you know, in some sense, uh, yeah, and the reference to psychoanalysis is correct. Uh, 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 in psychoanalysis, we, we, we know that uh, the contact with something without any structure, who is in, uh, what is in the Lacanian language, uh, the contact with the pure real, is something horrific, something terrible. And the same thing here. If uh, across the double structuration that is the count for one and so on and so on, we, 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 we have the risk of an encounter with the pure in inconsistent multiplicity. An inconsistent multiplicity is, uh, uh, is uh, for, for thinking, pure being that is without any signification, pure nonsense, actually. Because the sense itself cannot be the sense of the chaos, that is the sense of the nonsense, precisely. That is the pure multiplicity without any debate, uh, without any form, without any structure, and so on. And uh, it is why it's a necessity uh, to constitute what is named a situation, but in fact, uh, what uh, becomes uh, it, uh, a word to have a structuration which uh, is the structuration of the multiple as such, but in a form of uh, something as a one coming in external situation relatively uh, of the multiple as such. And uh, here, uh, because the goal is to explain what is the state, in general, the state of the situation, I uh, explain why we have, by necessity, a double structuration. Because uh, the first structuration is the structuration as uh, uh, the existence of sense, really. But it's not sufficient, because after all, a set can be also the, the form of pure multiplicity. Because we have infinite sense, precisely. And so uh, to return to something which is uh, acceptable for a subjectivity, we must have a double structuration at the level of elements and at the level of parts. But uh, it's true that when we have uh, something like a defeat of structuration, we are exposed, uh, we are exposed, to psychos <coughs> has the, the, the encounter of the pure real without any signification. Yeah. I, I think to maybe develop this uh, uh, this question of the void that is foreclosed from the double presentation, I had an idea to read. There's a brief mention at the page 10 uh, in the English version, uh, I will just read this short, um, short uh, passage so that we can uh, develop on that. Um, you say, uh, point two, uh, now to the seduction of poetic proximity, I admit I barely escaped it. I will oppose the radically subtractive dimension of being, foreclosed not only from representation, but from all presentation. I will say that being qua being does not in any manner 
let itself be approached, but solely, solely it allows itself to be sutured in its void to the brutality of a deductive consistency without aura. Being does not diffuse itself in rhythm and image, it does not reign over metaphor, it is the new sovereign of inference. Okay, and then you go on by developing on the poetic ontology, a reference to Heidegger, by saying that, you know, uh, you criticize these ontologies of the presence um, of Heidegger. Uh, and so I was curious just to develop on that, like how, if you could maybe talk a little bit about uh, this question of the suture, uh, the way how you say that the, the, the being allows itself to be sutured in its void uh, to the brutality of a deductive consistency without aura. Like, what do you exactly mean by this notion of the suture and why this double presentation is so necessary? Um, And in doing so, if I may add, in doing so, you've already, of course, used a lot of metaphors, poetic metaphors, <laughs> suture, brutality, <laughs> the humble, the arrogant, Non, mais je, je, cours, je cours dans ce passé, je fais un fight against, against Heidegger. Et donc, c'est l'idée que la réalisation de l'être comme est not in présence. Not in présence. Is not in what is the, the, the goal for poetry in general. To size the, the presence of the real in a, in, a, in a old figure of nature, in a tree, in, a, in the sea, and so on. The sensual metaphoric of uh, the presence of the. But not precisely uh, to think that being as such, we must take uh, the way of. Uh, will take the way of uh, uh, affectionatization. Affectionatization. That is the way of uh, structuration. <laughs> I think it's no <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yeah. like that. And so, uh, the, 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 the conclusion of the passage that we have two fundamental orientations in ontology, the poetical one and the mathematical one. The poetical one is the idea uh, to capture the presence as such. And uh, the objection is that it's impossible because if you are in the question of the presence, you introduce the one by necessity, because all presence is finally the presence of the one uh, in some sense, the sense of the one. And so, if it's not the case, we have a complete dissemination of the multiple, and uh, to think the, that sort of dissemination of the multiple, which is neutral, which is without any effect of presence, and so on, which is chaotic, and so on, we must uh, decide to accept the uh, uh, structuration of uh, the multiple In some sense, poetry is always, I think it's just, poetry is always the attempt to, to, to go to the presence without uh, the mediation of structure. And it's magnificent. I say, 
in the text that uh, when I read the words, I am not sorry, of course, <coughs> immediately, immediately, without any possible resistance. And it is because of the case I did, we have the idea of a movement which, in some sense, go to the present as such. But it is for part of fiction because there is no present as such. It's also a, a construction, but a construction which is in poetic construction invisible. Because uh, poetry is neither axiomatic nor conceptual. Poetry is a, a third possibility to language. It's not the axiomatic because you have no explicit decision. We have a, a constant decision, if you want, a not explicit decision in the form of a consensual axiomatic. Uh, uh, you, uh, you don't understand the, the poem from the point of view of the axiomatization of the poem. But it's but not uh, is it, not uh, uh, the idea of uh, structure of uh, presence in the sense of structure. It's the idea of uh, of uh, encounter between language and uh, and being as such, a fusion between language and presence. And it is why it was so interesting for Heidegger, Olderlin, and so on. Because it was something uh, like uh, 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 that being as such, but in my opinion, it's always in the form of the one. Uh, 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 and the fundamental obscurity of all great poems, because every great poem is obscure, it's a necessity, <laughs> but the very, the very extraordinary obscurity of the poem, which is also the charm of poetry in general, is that uh, 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 a poem supposes that uh, uh, something like uh, an hidden one uh, can be said by language. And see, uh, every poet in some sense is a liar. <laughs> but a magnificent liar, after all, uh, as a, 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 vrai, a vrai writer, the novel also is a, a complex of that is partly true in, in poetry, the, the magnificent falsity, <laughs> which says something at the end. It's not absurd, it says something, but something at the frontier of, uh, of uh, nothingness uh, and the form of presence. <laughs> in, in being an event, you introduce an idea of eventual sight, which is a multiple that is presented in the situation, but whose elements are not presented. So in that sense, it is something like a case point in presentation. Um, and uh, the way I read this, it, it sounds a lot like the notion of simple as uh, developed by the song and story. And so I was wondering, uh, would you agree with the statement that your project provides something like a, a general theory of the simple as it applies not only to individuals, but mm -hmm. uh, symptoms uh, in, in more general sense uh, in historical sequences. Mm -hmm. And also the, the idea of redemption as an operator of fidelity, could that maybe be used as a, a stand-in for the notion of uh, any interpretation? Oui, 
the, the, the notion of the inventor side is uh, the notion of the part of the situation uh, which is in the situation but uh, the composition, the global composition is not in the situation, the elements are not in the situation. I, I, I interpret your question in the direction of finally uh, the eventual side is the symptom of something which is not in the situation finally. Because it is the presence of some elements which are not themselves in the situation. And uh, I agree with you, it's not a so bad definition of the unconscious. <clears throat> that is, the unconscious presents something Without, say, without the elements of the something it, 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 it's present. It is why it is absurd or uh, pathological and so on. And so, so I, I, my, my answer is, yes, so it's, a, it's a, I, I restitute to you the idea that finally it's a general theory of symptom. <laughs> but, uh, the question is uh, the question of psychoanalysis itself. What is the operation of psychoanalysis in that sort of ontological interpretation of the symptom? The idea is uh, to constitute the possibility of the return of uh, the lacking elements in the situation. Something like that. And uh, uh, The point is the technical nature, but I can explain you uh, not without any difficulty. The question of the mental side is linked to the question of the axiom of foundation. Because the axiom of foundation say that uh, in every set there exist elements, the elements of which are not in the set. This axiom is fundamental because he is saying that the other is always present in all forms of identity. And we can say today the stranger is always present in all forms of identity. And the idea to expel the stranger of the identity is a criminal idea. Criminal idea because it's the idea of the destruction of the set itself. Because all set must accept that all elements can have some elements which are not elements. And in fact, the axiom of foundation says that uh, there is, in any case, one element, which, uh, uh, the element of which are not in the situation. Maybe many, maybe many, but one certain. So we can name this element the stranger of the situation. Stranger in the night of the situation. And, uh, and, uh, and finally, in the political field, the consequence is that we must accept that something like a stranger is in fact like me in the situation. Because it's the law of the real itself. And so it's something which says that the uh, uh, nationalism, racism and so on are pathological at the ontological level itself because they are negation of the, the, constitu the fundamental constitution of being which is saying that uh, something like a stranger is 
Hai di sisi inside the world. And if we return to psychoanalysis, which at this level is the same thing as progressist politics, <coughs> it's uh, the idea that uh, it's not because somebody is, uh, is present that, uh, as a stranger that he cannot be with us, exactly with us, at equality with us. And uh, at the uh, psychoanalytic level, it is said that the symptom is saying something of the very nature of the situation itself, because it's the law of the situation to have something like that. And so we can accept the symptom as a constitutive of the subjectivity. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the goal of the psychoanalysis is never to suppress the symptom, but to displace the symptom. And to displace the symptom is the mode by what the subject must accept the pathological symptom, but at another place, where it is not pathological. And it's always possible because the actual of foundation presents it. And so, all that is uh, uh, of uh, extremely important. And the discussion about the actual of foundation is uh, uh, a key uh, piece of all the uh, discussions concerning the uh, big and debate. And we, uh, there is a, a long explanation concerning the actual of foundation in the uh, immanence of truth. Because I return to this point uh, with more uh, details. That, uh, okay, shall we ask maybe one last question? Maybe we can take a couple of questions. Uh -huh. so, yeah, the couple. Of, and, and, and just have a couple of questions without yeah, answering. Can we take it to now to translate? Do more of the same. Fundamentally, but the whole project in some ways of the book 
Um, I was just wondering um, about this relationship or this linking of uh, philosophy and mathematics in the book. Uh, because on the one level of uh, the mathematics might be the discourse that allows for the highest level of formalization, uh, and therefore maybe it can help to, to encompass the being in a, in a very wide uh, grasp. But then at the same time, it makes abstraction of being in a certain way, which for instance, uh, natural sciences like physics, chemistry, and perhaps even the sciences of life like biology, don't do. And then in making abstraction of those areas, does it in some ways not ignore something very deeply that is about being itself? But, and then uh, uh, maybe now to contradict myself in a way also, but, but the other element of that is that but easily mathematics, uh, through its formalization, uh, so emptied of the object world as we discussed earlier, is in some ways the mathematical imagination, which can allow also for different types of formalization, as we discussed, you know, either through categories, uh, through sets, or even possibly through other mm -hmm. criteria. Uh, aren't those imaginations uh, also based in some ways of the object world and, and its observation? Uh, so my question then would be is would be perhaps if mathematics actually is a good parallel uh, for philosophy uh, to think about ontology and if we should not go instead to natural sciences and then see if there is a new project of ontology instead to be learned where philosophy would be meeting natural sciences. Concerning, uh, concerning uh, in politics, the relationship between singularity and collectivity, and we must uh, observe that uh, if you have a collectivity, you have a common trait, a common characteristic of uh, the multiplicity itself. So it's not uh, an indifferent collection of separate individuals, something like that. Because if you have only a separate collection of individuals, you have not collectivity. You cannot have the one of the collectivity. So you cannot have the representation of the collectivity as such. So all the point is uh, what is, what can be in politics, the representation of uh, the structure of the one of the collectivity or of some forms of collectivity. And uh, precisely, politics is, in some sense, the construction of something which is able to understand the unity of the collectivity. And the consequences, the active consequences, the possible consequences active of, uh, of uh, the, the, the unity of collectivity. And uh, this point is true for all politics and not only for good politics. Right? After that, we have a distinction between uh, uh, the unity 
which are in clear opposition with all forms of universality, for example, national unity, rational unity, and we are largely fiction, imaginary uh, unity, and a unity that can be uh, interpreted like a local form of something uh, having a universal value. And uh, it's a great uh, division of uh, what is named politics. The division of what is named politics is finally uh, in the modality of the construction of the unity of the collectivity. And uh, the criterion at the end is, uh, uh, is between the pure uh, local singularity and uh, uh, something which can have a universal value. Why we know that something can have a universal value is precisely the difficulty of politics. <coughs> and it's a uh, dependency of circumstances, uh, a historical sequence, uh, you and wait and so on. But uh, what is, uh, what is common to some part of humanity is the point of politics, always. And is uh, the criterion of the part of humanity concerned by your politics is uh, something which can approach of a generic set, is the political question. All progressive politics is the politics of the generic collectivity. as a, a question uh, which uh, is also attending some form of weakness of uh, being a leader. The idea is that the level where we can say that mathematics is ontology is fine, the so abstract level where the thing which exists is only so good concerning its being. But its being, precisely, is not its particularities. Because to have particularities, first, you must exist as a being. And so the abstraction is a necessity at the level of ontology. Because ontology don't take care of singularities as such, but only in the form of multiplicity which is realized in a uh, real object. So, I don't uh, uh, say that, uh, that uh, ontology is the final possibility of uh, knowledge, uh, science, and so on. Not at all. It is uh, the, the most abstract form. And uh, what is not given in uh, being an event is precisely a theory of words. And you find that in the logic of the world. In the logic of the world, on the contrary, there are many considerations concerning uh, the relationship between objects, the composition of uh, the object, the part of the object, and we have uh, uh, a concept not of being, but of objectivity. And naturally, science of the world are not reducible to mathematics. If this is living uh, bodies, it's uh, biology, uh, uh, forms of uh, material existence are physics and so on. But all that sort of science concern specific words. And so they are not universal in the same sense as an ontology. Because in a specific world, we can have some particular objects and the science of this particular object. 
fait, euh, mais oui, la Nother World, it's not exactly the same disposition of objects and the same science. We don't, we don't know, really. And in the case of the theory of pure multiplicities, we have a universality in principle, because we have nothing else than different forms of multiplicity. But I don't uh, affirm that to think the forms of multiplicity of something is to understand the thing itself in its totality, absolutely not. But it explains that generally, in all forms of science, we have a part of mathematics. And in some sense, it's a strange fact. If you have the idea that mathematics is a pure game, uh, a pure creation of human thinking, why we have so many mathematics in the understanding of the concrete world? It has been, uh, even Einstein has said that it was a miracle, finally. That there is something which is very difficult to understand. Why mathematics as a creation of the human uh, intellect uh, is uh, so important in physics uh, and even part uh, of biology and so on. But I have an answer. <coughs> mathematics is required only because mathematics is in any case in the science of the basis, the common basis of all what exists. And finally, the key difference is the difference between to be and to exist. Because I, I, uh, to be is to realize a form of pure multiplicity. To exist is always relative to a world, because you exist in a definite world. And so we can say that we have the pure science of being, and that all other forms of science are science of existence, in some sense something which exists. But exist is not, has no absolute sense. To exist is always to exist in a specific world. And, a, and, and to be submitted to the logic of this world. <laughs> is there some re last really pressing question? <laughs> that cannot go unanswered. <laughs> what we were thinking, maybe to close, is if there were some remaining questions, we could gather those and perhaps give Alain then the final word uh, for this evening, mm -hmm. after we hear any remaining questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. are, there some, are there some last questions we could just gather? I, I, I can see that I can, I can uh, produce the last question. <laughs> <laughs> the last question is, in fact, the question, uh, uh, which, is, which is a very, very common question. At the end, why philosophy? Why philosophy? Because philosophy is not uh, producing truth, because truth is procedure of truth. Philosophy is not really uh, anthropology, so science of human beings as such. It's not the ontology, because ontology is mathematics. It's not politics, it's not art, it's not science. And so it's a, it's a real question that, which, which has been the question of philosophy from the very beginning because we find in every philosophy many considerations concerning philosophy. And the, the, the question of philosophy is a philosophical question. So <coughs> it's a purely immanent also. And uh, if, uh, for example, what was the nature of our discussion today? <coughs> It was a philosophical discussion, certainly, but what is exactly the point? I think that, that philosophy is uh, 
the attempt to create a possible orientation of thinking. It's not uh, thinking as such, because there is more thinking in some sense in all forms of conditions of philosophy, science, politics, and so <clears throat> But all truths don't constitute a general orientation of the living beings we are. And so, if I take my proper work, I can think that, I can propose to say that philosophy is the attempt to say to human beings that the, the existence of truths is very important for their destiny. It's not to create a new truths. I don't think so. But it's to propose a new or good use of the existence of truths in their specific fields. And this is what I name orientation, to create a possible orientation of life at the light of truth. And it's a necessity sometimes because truths by themselves don't indicate the use of truth. Truths are truths. We can have the patient to produce truths, but not the patient to produce truths. The patient of the mathematician is not the patient of the use of mathematics. It's the mathematician patient, the, the, math, the patient to produce truths, in fact. And the patient of produce truths is not the same thing that the possibility to learn the possible use of existing truths. So philosophy is not in some sense a creative, uh, uh, really creative discipline, but much more something like the proposition of an order of thinking by a good use of uh, uh, existing truths. And uh, it is why uh, it's a uh, it's always a corruption of use. <laughs> it's always a corruption of use. It has been said, it has been said for Socrates. Because it's always also uh, inappropriate to uh, what the society as such, the collectivity as such, uh, proposed to the use. Because collectivity propose to use to to be useful for the collectivity in a form of representation of the collectivity. So the collectivity propose always a form of integration to the collectivity. And if you say, oh, it's not really the collectivity which is interesting, but truth, that is in some sense universality. Universality is more interesting than particularity. That is the final idea. <laughs> and, uh, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a subversive activity. It's not a normal activity. Because always normal activity is, okay, find a place, a good place in the world as it is. <coughs> And philosophy, eh, 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 by itself, is the idea that what is a good orientation of life may be not exactly to find a, a good place in the world as it is, but 
Et puis, c'est aussi différent. Par exemple, pour chercher un way the world at the light of something universal and so on and so on. And it's uh, from the point of view of the dominant order, all forms of dominant order, it's always something dangerous to say something. And uh, in fact, this philosophy is the contrary of uh, adaptation to the world as it is. In the best case, <coughs> because there are naturally false philosophies, which are uh, philosophy of domestication, of uh, <coughs> use. And that uh, I have, uh, I have uh, do a uh, great quantity of philosophy during my life, and uh, I have, uh, at the end, I, I know that philosophy is, uh, is difficult in some sense. The difficulty being to realize an acceptable compromise between the universality of proposition and the concrete life of collectivity. <clears throat> you cannot propose sacrifice uh, and so on uh, uh, without uh, good results. It's orientation, but orientation is also orientation in the world as it is, in some sense. Even if the orientation is to change the world, is to change this world. And so it's a difficulty because in some sense, philosophy must also have its proper interpretation of the world as it is, not only interpretation of orientation in the world. We cannot eliminate all form of realism uh, concerning the situation. But inside of all that, if philosophy has an interest and a particularity, is to propose sometimes uh, with difficulty in some circumstances and so on, the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, something in the life uh, uh, which is uh, in the light of uh, universality. And, uh, I propose to say, in the, finally, in the light of absoluteness. <laughs> we can close yeah. uh, on this terrible word. <laughs> <laughs>